back, right? Uh -huh. But if this omnipotent being does not respond back, how do you know if it exists? Okay, that gets back to the question of why I believe God exists. Hello everyone, I'm Professor Plink. I respond to various theological and ideological questions and claims from a rationalistic and naturalistic approach in an effort to give and explain the opposite viewpoint and help to balance the conversation. Cliff Connectly is back at it again on a college campus, proselytizing to the student body, and college evangelizers like him really seem to be doing a bang-up job bringing the educated to or back to the faith, what with college graduates being the least religious educational demographic in the country, with the highest percentage of atheists. Merge that with the general trend that is continuing of less and less religious belief across the board in the U.S., and Cliff and people like him really seem to be fighting a losing battle against rationality and a general rejection of theology at large. And in this little snippet from Cliff's informal religious pontification to these young people, he's going to be quick-shotting his way through the ten reasons he believes in an unproven, undemonstrated, magical, ethereal, incorporeal, omnipotent, omniscient, omnibenevolent mythological being. And though he'll be busting through these ten rather quickly, I thought it would be a good idea to take apart each one of them in turn. But before we get to that, if you end up liking what you see in this video and would like to help out the channel, make sure to subscribe and click the bell so you'll always be notified when new content comes out. Check out my social media, including my Patreon and Twitter, all linked in the description. And of course, like this video, pop in a comment. All that goes a long way towards pleasing the YouTube algorithm. All praise be to the real and true higher power that is the all-knowing algorithmo and keeping my channel motoring along. Now on to today's video. I don't believe God exists because he's answered my prayers. Okay? Well, that would tend to be an obvious thing, I would think. Given that prayer has been shown to be ineffective and successful at about the same rate as random chance, and as author David McAfee put it, prayer doesn't work. Perhaps it makes the believer feel better, in the same way that meditation or deep thought would, but prayer doesn't actually affect the external world. Not only is it ineffective, but it's also a very narcissistic practice. Why would a god change its divine plan to accommodate any person's wishes? So, not only does God not answer prayers, it's foolish to think that any god would, when doing so would go against his plan, that believers are always so quick to appeal to whenever something terrible happens. But it's good that Cliff doesn't believe in God because of prayer, so let's get into the reasons that he does believe in God. I believe that God exists because the order and the design of the cosmos points to a designer. The argument from design. The order and design that some believe that they see does not point to a designer. For starters, there's no apparent design in the cosmos, near as I can tell. Everything that we see in the cosmos that seems structured or ordered does so through a clear and explained process of natural occurrences. I mean, we know how stars form and the natural forces that are at play that cause them to do so. We know how stars eject stellar dust that eventually accumulates through gravity and coalesces into planets. We know how planets form the way that they do, and, in the case of ours, forms land masses, atmosphere, oceans, weather patterns, and eventually the proper conditions for life to form. These things do not point to a designer. They point to a natural series of processes that took things from the rapid expansion of space-time to what we see around our little corner of existence today. And it all looks so ordered and structured but there are plenty of instances where that supposed structure and order break down. The closer you get to a black hole, for instance, the more our basic laws of physics or understanding of them break down. And those laws of physics are foundational to our understanding of order. They're things like time dilation, the warping of space-time, light itself working totally differently, such a wonky, swanky mishmash of imperceivable chaos that Christopher Nolan tried to rationalize it as being trapped inside an infinite series of 4D bookcases. All of this is one little girl's bedroom. Every moment. It's infinitely complex. 
and current science estimates that there are as many as 40 quintillion black holes in the observable universe. That's a heck of a lot of chaos that doesn't conform to the order and apparent design that you're basing this belief on. The reality is that both order and chaos are natural states of the universe. Some places have more order, some places are more chaotic. The fact that we live in a pocket that is generally ordered should not cause one to extend that perception to the whole of the cosmos and then infer that there was a magical orderer rather than just it being a result of natural processes. I believe that God exists because everything that has a beginning has a cause. The universe has a beginning, therefore the universe has to have a cause. This is Lobar Bill's Kalam cosmological argument, and it's patently false. It is not necessarily true that everything that has a beginning has a cause. Quantum physics shows us that things can come into existence with seemingly no cause. And though some might say that just because we can't determine a cause doesn't mean that there isn't one, and while that might be true, you can't then say that those things must have a cause because everything that exists must have a cause. That would be assuming the conclusion as part of the premise and that would be a begging the question fallacy. Near as we can tell, there are things that can begin to exist without a cause. Furthermore, even if that were a true principle and things had to have a cause in order to come into existence, it would only apply to things that begin to exist. And we have no evidence that the universe began to exist. Unless you're going to play fast and loose with the definition of the term begins to exist. The universe only began to exist in the same way that, say, a piece of glass began to exist when lightning struck sand on a beach. Everything that the glass came from already existed, and it was just a natural process that caused the sand to heat up enough to melt and fuse together and become glass. And everything that the universe came from already existed. This is why theists are so quick and so often primed to assert the Big Bang as the explosion of the universe out of nothing, so that they can then claim that it was the beginning of the universe. But, ahem, the Big Bang was not the explosion of the universe out of nothing. It is the expansion of the current presentation of our universe from an initial state of high density and temperature. So the universe already existed when the Big Bang occurred, it just existed in a different form, that of the primordial singularity of high density and temperature. So it isn't that there was nothing, and then the universe began to exist. The universe, near as we can tell, always existed. It just existed in a different form, and then turned into the universe as we know it which could easily, and in all likelihood was, a natural occurrence, much like that glass on the beach. I believe that God exists because the anthropic principle, life is balanced on a razor's edge, to try and argue that all oh, this just happened by chance is absurd for me. The anthropic principle, in short, is the idea that the laws of the universe are such that they allow for life to develop and evolve, and that those specific conditions are not only necessary, but were unlikely to occur by chance. As such, this reason is not really all that different from Cliff's first reason, the argument from design or order. And basically the same refutation applies. There are places in the universe where things are different, where the laws of physics break down in such a way as to preclude the possibility of anything we know as life developing. In point of fact, the vast majority of the universe is inhospitable to anything we would think of as life. Humans couldn't survive on 99.9% .9 plus of the universe. Heck, we can barely survive on our own planet, the majority of which is under the surface, and we certainly can't survive more than a few miles down, and most of the surface would kill us through drowning, and the bits that we can live on have about a million different ways of killing us too. The fact that some life exists within the comparatively tiny pockets capable of supporting life in the universe seems rather unimpressive. But then, as to the constants of the universe being what they are and being necessary, things like the mass of an electron or the strength of gravity and how, if any of these constants were different, life couldn't exist? Well, for one, 
they would have to establish that it is even possible that these factors could be different to begin with. We really don't know why an electron has the mass that it does and not some other mass. Just like we don't know exactly why the speed of light is exactly 299,792,458 meters per second. Seems a rather arbitrary number, doesn't it? Why that and not a different speed? Well, because we don't know why the constants are what they are, we can't say that it is even possible for them to be any different. It may not be possible for the speed of light to be anything other than what it is. It may not be possible for the mass of a neutron to be anything other than what it is. And if that's the case, that the constants of the universe are fixed, set, and impossible that they ever could have been different, then them being what they are is not mere chance. It's an inevitability. So in order to posit the anthropic principle as a reason for believing in God, one must first insist that the constants of the universe could have occurred differently than they did, and that they have an equal chance of occurring in some different way, therefore leaning towards the idea that they must have been set the way they are by an intelligence with the power to do so, i.e. God. And that is just a lot of bald assumptions about things you have no reason to think are true. I believe that God exists because the amount of information in the DNA of a single cell is so densely packed, it demands an intelligent mind. Ugh. This is one I'm really getting annoyed about responding to, because it basically boils down to playing word games to try to confuse people who aren't prepared for it. Look, when we think of the word information, it generally means knowledge possessed by an intelligent being. You would say, a person knows a lot of information about the field of study that they've engaged in. And so by using the word information, it automatically denotes that there is an intelligence behind it. Because people generally think an intelligence is required to transmit information. But in the case of genetics, information just means the attribute inherent in and communicated by one of two or more alternative sequences or arrangements of something, such as nucleotides in DNA or binary digits in a computer program, that produces specific effects. So, it's when the chemistry at work produces specific effects or traits. And the fact that a specific arrangement of atoms and molecules produces specific traits is insanely commonplace. I mean, look, one of the simplest molecules is that of oxygen. O2. Two atoms bonded together. About as simple of a molecule as you can possibly get. And it creates oxygen. And with that comes all of the traits or information about oxygen. How it interacts with other atoms and forms different molecules. Or how it's necessary for all life to exist and how those life forms process oxygen in order to keep their biological functions operational. Combine a little oxygen with a little hydrogen and you get water, and look how different water is from oxygen, and all of the specific and different traits that come with that. Or take an oxygen molecule and slap in one more atom, and you go from O2 to O3, or ozone. And look how vastly different the traits or information are that ozone has from oxygen. Oxygen, we must breathe it in order to survive. But breathe ozone, and it damages your lungs and, in high volumes, kills you. But it does filter out harmful UV radiation in a way that oxygen cannot. So, this is just one example of the vast complexity that even the simplest of molecules have. This is how chemistry works. This is what chemistry does. Even simple molecules have tons of specific traits, and thus, lots of information. And it's entirely natural. It therefore makes perfect sense that a vastly more complex molecule, like DNA, would have similarly extensive traits, and thus, information associated with it. The idea of information in molecules pointing to a god is predicated on the notion that the only natural state is simplicity. 
And information in molecular biology is synonymous with the idea of complexity. Therefore, God. But complexity is a natural state of being. Like we already established earlier, both order and chaos are natural states. And well, an extension of that is the complexity, a sign of high order, is also a natural state. And simplicity, more aligned with chaos, is also a natural state. There's no reason to think that the complexity of forms that comes by way of the chemical interactions and molecular development is anything other than a natural, unguided, undesigned process. I believe that God exists because it's more reasonable to believe that life comes from life than it is to believe that life comes from non-life. Don't even get this one, because we're talking about physical, biological life, right? Well, the God that you believe in is not physical, and is certainly not biological. So even in your Christian worldview, you don't believe that the first biological life came from other biological life. You believe that life was magically created from nothing. Or sorry, no, got that wrong. You believe that God created the first life, Adam, from dirt. Was that dirt alive? No, obviously not. So you do believe that life came from non-life. Through magic. Through God magic. I believe that God exists because I notice that human beings have this innate drive for meaning in life. The only way there can be real meaning in life is if God created us for a purpose. And this innate drive that I notice that we human beings have for meaning is best explained by the fact that we were created for a purpose. Amazing. Every word of what you just said was wrong. Not all humans have an innate drive for meaning. There are plenty of people who are nihilists and don't believe life has any purpose or meaning at all, nor do they want any. You then insist that meaning and purpose can only be derived from an objective meaning or purpose handed down from on high, ignoring the possibility of people creating meaning and purpose for themselves, based on their own drives and desires, wants and needs. Then, you say that the innate desire for meaning is best explained by the idea of it being magically created out of the non-life of dirt by God magic for a divinely imposed purpose. When it's much easier explained as an evolutionary imperative. Look at the things that are most commonly thought of by people as reasons for living. To have love in their life, a family, a spouse, children, grandchildren. That's the biological drive to mate and procreate. Or to learn and understand all they can. Well, that's the drive to reduce fear and uncertainty, as well as to make one's environment safer and make it more prosperous for ourselves and our communities. That furthers our own success and the success of our species. To help others furthers the species' survival and success. To do something important for society furthers the species' survival and success, etc. All our supposed drive for meaning is, is a drive to improve conditions for the further advancement and success of ourselves, our kin, our community, our society, and our species at large. And this is most easily and even effortlessly explained as an evolutionary adaptation more so than by assuming magical, supernatural, otherworldly machinations of a metaphysical being, supposedly perfect in every way, but created flawed beings through magic, and then giving them the exact same drives and desires that they would have come to through natural selection. I believe that God exists because the evidence of a conscience that ties me into moral absolutes demands a moral lawgiver. Another one I'm tired of refuting over and over. There are no moral absolutes. There has never been a single moral idea or principle that has ever been so ubiquitous as to be described as a universal moral absolute. All morality is, by its very nature, subjective. If indeed there were such a thing as moral absolutes, as in totally objective morality, then your God could not exist as claimed. In order for morality to be truly objective, 
That law would have to exist absent of interpretation by any thinking agent. That would include the God you believe in. As it stands, the morality that you believe in was set by a God, and that is unavoidably subjective. It is subject to the interpretation of that God, and therefore can be changed. I mean, it's changed all over in the Bible. When the New Testament and the teachings of Jesus are supposed to be the New Covenant, and in many ways is supposed to overwrite the Old Covenant of the Old Testament. Therefore, your God is supposedly giving new laws that supersede and alter the old ones. That shows the subjective nature of your theological morality. In order for morality to be truly objective, it would have to exist as a brute fact of existence, self-existent and unchanging. Morality would have to exist independent of God, and God would therefore not be able to alter it. And if God did not create morality, then God did not create all things. He's not the Alpha. And if God cannot change morality, then he's not all-powerful. He's not omnipotent. So to have objective morality is to say that the all-powerful Alpha, creator of all things that you believe in, does not exist. Even if some lesser powerful God-being did exist, it would not be the one that you believe in as you and your faith have defined him. So, objective morality is a defeater to Christianity. Well, good thing for your theology that objective morality doesn't exist anyway. I believe that God exists because I experience love. And if there is no God, love is simply a biochemical reaction. I'm sorry, my experience of reality is there's more to love than simply a biochemical reaction. I experience love too, and in my experience of reality, love is nothing more than a biochemical reaction. The fact that it feels stronger and deeper than a mere chemical to you is a feature of that biochemical reaction. The sociological utility and benefits provided by love bonds would not exist if that love bond felt weak or meaningless. People wouldn't be so quick to defend their infants if that bond between them felt like it was a fleeting thing, no more powerful than the sugar rush you get when you down a pixie stick. The fact that it feels like something more important and stronger than that is a biological requirement for it to be the evolutionary benefit that it is. Your deeply felt love for those you are bonded with drive you to do a multitude of things that you otherwise wouldn't without it that are to the benefit and success of the species. To say that with such disdain, Nothing more than a biological, chemical reaction. Like that means that it's practically nothing. We are biology. We are chemicals. Biological chemical reactions is about as major as it gets for us. You think it's something magical? Spiritual? Okay, prove magic or spirits exist. Until you do, biochemical reactions is the height of experience. It doesn't get any bigger than that. I believe that God exists because I experience free will. And free will shows me that there's more to you and me than just a machine. We're human beings with a free will. That demands there be a God, a personal being, who creates us and gives us this free will. Do you actually experience free will or do you experience the illusion of free will? How would you know the difference between the two? How can you tell that the decisions you make are not the result of your biological processes, including your mental processes, all being strictly the result of your current brain state, prior experiences informing decision-making in the present, and your biological drives? How can you tell that you have true, libertarian free will? That is, the idea that you have the ability to make decisions free of any influence of any kind, including those of your own physiology. How do you conclude that that is true and biological determinism isn't true? That your decisions aren't just the end result of the purely biological functions of your brain and body? Furthermore, how can you believe in free will when you have the deeply held belief in the Christian God because the Christian God absolutely precludes the possibility of true libertarian free will? The God of the Bible is consistently described as omniscient, with perfect, uncontested knowledge of the future. 
This is why God is able to reveal the future to his chosen prophets, because God knows exactly what will happen in the future. Not what might happen, not what is likely but still alterable, but what is going to happen, no question, no possibility of changing it. This absolutely eliminates the possibility of free will and replaces it with divine determinism. All life would therefore be slaves to the unchangeable, predetermined reality that God has foreseen, and, since all is in accordance with God's divine plan, the predetermined reality that God has created and chosen. So everything you do, God has foreseen you doing, knew you were going to do it in advance, and you could not have done anything differently. Your choices are predetermined. You only think you're making them freely. But even in your theistic worldview, that free choice is an illusion. All of it predetermined by God's will. Under Christianity, you have no free will. So much like objective morality is a defeater of the Christian belief in God, free will is also a defeater of the Christian belief in God. I believe that there's a God because I notice that all human beings, myself included, have a drive for life after death. The only way there can be life after death is if there is some type of God who is able to give us this life after death. Humans don't really have a drive for life after death. Humans have a drive for life. Period. Full stop. We have an instinctive biological drive to continue living. But we see that death is inevitable. So how does one reconcile a desire for life continuing with the reality of its ending? Well come up with stories about a second life that one moves on to upon death. And just like any fantasy based on innate desires, we come up with a lot of different variations. Heaven, hell, nirvana, reincarnation, becoming powerful spirits ourselves, getting wings in a halo turning into an angel, merging our consciousness with the great spirit. On and on the stories go. Anything we can come up with to tell ourselves that we will continue to exist once our bodies expire. But what logic is there in that? I mean, one of the few constants in reality seems to be the finality of all things. That everything that begins to exist ultimately ceases to exist. Everything that has a beginning has an end, Neil. Even Christianity expresses this. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust, the Alpha and the Omega, beginning and end. It makes perfect sense that when our lives end, we return to the state of non-existence that we had before we were born. I mean, the material that makes up our bodies will, of course, continue and become other things. But after our death, we are no more an individual being than we were in all of the billions of years before we were born. That makes massively more sense than, I want life after death to be real because I don't want to die. I mean, if I could get Christians and religious believers of all stripes to realize one single thing, it's that what you want to be true has absolutely no bearing on what is true. These are facts, and facts don't care about your feelings. And that was the quickfire ten reasons that Cliff Connectly believes in God. All of them things that we've heard time and time again by religious apologists, and all of them terrible reasons for believing in unproven magic in the first place. Many were completely wrong in their conception, like the Kalam cosmological argument, or argument from design. Some were actually defeaters of his theology, like free will or objective morality. And some were just pie-in-the-sky wishful thinking, like I want love to be more than chemicals, and I want there to be an afterlife. But none of it had any real argumentative oomph to it. At this point, it's all a lot of seemingly desperate rationalizations of someone terrified that they might be wrong. So their rationales have just enough pseudo-reasoning in them to keep themselves and others of the same mindset warm at night, secure in their beliefs. But not much here for anyone looking for actual sound reasons to think their beliefs have even the slightest chance of being correct. And so that is where we'll end things for today. So thanks for watching, everyone. Don't forget to like this video, comment, and subscribe so you'll always be notified when a new video comes out. Don't forget to check out my Twitter and my Patreon if you'd like to support me directly. My Teespring if you want some Plinky merchandise. 
all that link below in the description. Special shout out to my most recent super thankers here on YouTube, Salvi Mike, Piao Octonawa, Design Tech DK, Banana Slug 1951, Dr. Biro SP, and LHRPG Official. Until next time, I'm Professor Plink reminding you to keep striving for greater understanding. It's the best way to get wherever you want to go.